Well, good morning to you all and welcome to the AFI Group quarterly webinar uh, today on uh, mute batteries and, and how we can get a bit more out of it. Hopefully you can hear me all, um, which would be great, and all being well, you can see my screen. If you do have any uh, dramas at all, um, I'm in the laps of um, any uh, IT gremlins, please let me know um, by um, by sending me a, a question or, or, uh, or uh, you know, ultimately... Um, you know, putting on the chat. Okay, um, so the subject uh, which has been chosen this month is really to see how we can get more from our mute batteries, which in truth are probably often overlooked during any hire or use period. We kind of just assume that it's going to, you know, it's going to provide us what we need for our, you know, for our allotted hire. So that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, the running time of the webinar is approximately 45 to 50 minutes there or thereabouts. Uh, and I'll aim to finish with a short question and answer session at the end. With regards to question folks, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Um, during the webinar, um, I will. Uh, I have a little screen which I can see the webinar, uh, see the questions coming in. I'll endeavour to answer them as best as I can. Clearly, you know, if I do run out of time, I'm, I'm mindful you've also got busy day jobs and such. So, uh, you know, I will answer these questions afterwards. This webinar has been recorded um, and you will receive this recording in the next couple of days from, from the AFI group um, via the web, uh, via the, the login, the email that you sent. Okay, um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm say um, business development manager for AFI group of company, companies. Um, been in the business you know, over 10 years, been with MUPS now well over 20 years, um, sometimes feels like only yesterday, um, and been in and around construction plant for, for over 25 years. Some of the names that I can see in the webinar are familiar, so welcome back and thank you for supporting it. Um, uh, equally, uh, there are some new people here today, so, you know, I'm quite, you know, I say it as it is, so hopefully you can uh, you can see my passion for making sure that, you know, we have people going home safely and to their families, etc. Um, as you can see from them on various sort of groups and, and, and committees and such, um, not going to dwell too much on that, but, you know, it's it's hopefully evident there that, you know, I do like to get involved uh, and try and make the uh, the industry a safer place. Um, so, OK, um, just as we move on, and I'll try and keep to keep the time as best as we can. Um, I suppose, you know, batteries, you know, it, it's one of these things we, we hire a, a piece of equipment, you know, most of the things we have in our daily lives these days, electrical wise, have potentially ability to be, you know, recharged, um, be it um, via a device, by, via a, 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 like your toothbrush that you put on something. We take them for granted, I think, a little bit uh, in some respects. Um, and, you know, I know from from myself how I recall uh, from being frustrated from you know potentially lack of power um, such as mobile phones um, you know iPads um, shavers uh, not that I use my shaver much as my wife would probably wish I use my shaver a bit a bit longer um, but charge just never seems to last that long does it you know and again it's about usage and how we how we do things and, and what we're doing and it's fair to say battery manufacturers you know have come a long way. Um, you know, and no doubt with the onset of electrification in our lives ever increasing, it'll be interesting to see how this works out in the future. Um, a quick look on YouTube or Google shows many sort of potential, you know, future sort of, uh, you know, aspects of how electricity will be in the world. But, you know, when we consider in a work context, this potentially hits us in the pocket with delays, you know, potential cost, downtime uh, and potentially, you know, you know, fines for not for late completion of work, you know, albeit down to, you know, it may be other th other aspects. But, you know, if you think of a power drill or a saw, easy to charge, easy to change battery effectively, because often, you know, we'll buy an extra battery or, or whatever. Even my, my power drill at home, I've got a spare battery so I can, you know, one goes, I can jump, you know, put, pop the other one in. But it's not so simple with electric powered MUPES. They're delivered and they use the duration of the project. But just how efficient, you know, really are they? Um, now, whilst preparing this webinar, you know, liaising with our own AFI support services and our AFI engineering team, it became apparent uh, that the biggest issues we have as a business with respect to breakdowns is actually due to batteries. Um, and when we've interrogated this data further, um, reviewed information and, and looked at sort of some of the aspects, it's often, uh, often unfortunately down to a number of factors. 
yes, you're going to have the odd battery failure. Yeah, it's inevitable. You know, things do happen. And, and you know, and, and a bank of batteries, if, if one battery goes um, and, and starts to fail, it's going to drag other batteries down. But, you know, and unfortunately, people that are, are attending this webinar today, it's often highlighting operator error. Um, so this, in, it's, this includes failure to check the batteries um, and inspect them properly you know, how they actually use the machine um, and, and what sort of cycles they use when, the char when they're using the machine, but also charging and maintaining the batteries over the time of the, of the period of the project. Um, but to be fair to you today, people using and managing and ordering MUPS, you know, how many times have it potentially, potentially you've been invite, identified that batteries are either not charging or keeping the charge and, and there's a necessary call to your relevant hire company to say, you know, come on, you know, my machine's lasting two hours or, or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, for example, what, what if batteries weren't charged for the specified time? Or perhaps even someone's, you know, stolen your charge. You know, in other words, operators on site, other operators on site. Now, recently, I, I said earlier, you saw a bit of my background I've been, I've been with the group uh, a long time now um, but you know I still get involved with site uh, interactions and, and recently I had what we call a discussion with a site manager I guess who expressed his concerns and, and, and belief that you know the batteries aren't particularly doing what they should be doing but perceived that batteries should be capable of you know and he rightly expected the batteries to be charged when delivered so we tick that box essentially but then he expected the machines to run fully all day every day simply plug them in and carry out the same process for the four weeks that they were using the machines. Um, now, when he subsequently began to have breakdowns due to batteries not holding their charge, he raised the issue with his relevant account manager. That's kind of where I was brought in, um, and that's part of my role in the group. But from discussions with him, I informed him that his operators need to top up the batteries in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Um, his response was that, you know, one that he expected higher companies to do this. Well, True, it's done that at, at the point of uh, of hire on a PDI, but you know I had to kind of go down the example of giving him a car, hire car. You know, he used the fuel. You've got to top the fuel up. You've got to check the machine over, and it's clearly his responsibility. So I won't go into details, but quite a long discussion, as you could expect, and he eventually capitulated and agreed that you know he would have to provide the necessary equipment to top up the batteries. He would have to provide the necessary PPE. To protect his employees of which you know we'll discuss that a little bit more later so um just quickly looking at the agenda um you know clearly they're an expensive part of the machine often overlooked and and as we found you know under maintained by the user of the mupe um so in terms of of, of us as a business we attribute it to around about 40 percent of our breakdowns are battery related they're an expensive element um, you know, and costing not only yourselves in downtime, but also potentially the cost of any replacement batteries if you've been negligent or if your operator has been negligent in their care of the batteries. Clearly, correct battery, char uh, battery maintenance and, and, and inspections and charging can reduce downtime on, on site. Um, and I've just seen there, it says I'm, Sarah just says it's saying I'm muted by the organizer. Sarah, that's just so I don't get all the background chatter coming back and forth. Um, so if you do get any, 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 any questions, please, you know, you can send, send questions on. Um, this is a list only. It's live. So um, hence, hence uh, I'd get uh, dis in interruptions whilst I'm doing, doing the webinar. Um, so correct charging and maintenance, not, not only extends the life of the battery, but also the performance of its battery life. So, um, and Electric machines, generally speaking, relatively simple machines in, in respect. They're inherently re reliable, um, but the battery cost is quite a high proportion of the actual cost of the machine when, when we look at that. OK, types of power. So you'll be familiar with various things such as diesel power machines. Cre clearly at the moment, there's a drive to move away from diesel um, and some of the non-road uh, uh, plant in terms of this and, and some of the, the, the uh, emissions that this give. I have done a previous webinar on, on emissions and you'll see that on the uh, AFI group page. Um, clearly, we have battery powered. We have biofuel. So that could be a mixture of diesel uh, and, and battery. Um, we have by energy machines, so electric machines, um, which will have some type of, of, of um, you know, method of, of charging potentially, and of course hybrid, uh, and there's other other aspects of machines out there as well. And no doubt, you know, the way the manufacturers are going, there's going to be many other sort of aspects that they potentially uh, can bring into our market. So. Um, 
it's only right to give you a bit of a sort of a, uh, a brief summary of how batteries are constructed. After all, good battery condition is essential to good performance and clearly operational safety. So improper fluid levels or damaged cables can, can potentially result in component da damage and hazardous conditions. And if we think about um, you know, the, the various parts of the machine, we're going to have some type of case. Um, we're going to have terminals within that case of that uh, battery we're going to have a series of, of, of plates um, at the top of uh, at the top of the batteries we're going to have some way to dissipate the the energy that's in there um, so when the machine is on charge it's going to if it's a lead acid battery it's going to create hydrogen gas so it's going to have venting caps um, obviously there are other types of batteries such as maintenance free which are sealed batteries you're going to have gel batteries lithium etc um, you're going to have some way of securing um, the battery to the to the machine, um, and there can be various ways, um, you know, clamps and, and bars and such like that. And you're going to have an, a way and a means of isolating that battery, which we'll cover a little bit later on. Um, battery weight, clearly, to any you know, if anybody's ever picked up a car battery, it sometimes perhaps su surprises you, you know, actually how heavy these batteries are. Well, try try picking up one of them. Yeah, they're probably best part of 40 50 kilos um you know and and one of these things you know is is if you think that that particular machine has dual sided batteries so they're critical to the actual counterweight of the machine itself um and and the size and the type and and, and the, the power in, involved in that is, is going to be sort of different types okay there's example of a, of a lithium battery so you can see there are there are ways in which they're going um you know completely sealed and uh, and, that, and these are so you know same manufacturer that you can see from top to bottom so there's some great strides in battery coming in, in that sense so um obviously in terms of batteries we'll we'll We'll, we'll get onto that a little bit later on, but you can see some of the cables and terminals and, and the white vent caps at the top of the battery on the top. So hopefully I'm not, I'm not teaching you anything that you maybe don't know here. If you are, great. Uh, you know, and you can see there, there's a clamping mechanism to clamp them all down, um, but a little bit more about that later. So uh, safety. Um, you know, I suppose you've got to really question the hazard versus the risk. Um, and it would be remiss of me uh, not to mention the safety and potential risk from batteries. Um, and it's fair to say that throughout the years, technology has moved on somewhat in this area. And like I said earlier, will no doubt in time improve further. I've worked with batteries now on and off for some 25 years now. Yes, right, I'll be honest with you, I've seen them explode. Uh, but thankfully, I've never been involved in an explosion directly. Why? It's fairly simple, you know, because I follow the rules. Um, now, there are perhaps some of you listening which may say that the safest method is to remove the risk altogether and not have the employee touch, check, or even maintain the battery. Now, I, you know, I'm not here to disagree with your policies and your procedures. Um, however, the more we shy away, in my, my, my sort of simplistic way, the more that we shy away from these um, sort of aspects, the less skilled people will become. Um, but ultimately, I've always had respect for the battery. Um, now, batteries, as I said earlier, uh, earlier I made up a series of plates, lead, lead oxide with typically 35% sulfuric acid and 65% water uh, sol sol solution. The solution when mixed is called electrolyte uh, and which when, uh, when electricity passed across the positive and ne negative terminal posts uh, causes a chemical reaction, which in turn gives us power. Okay, batteries uh, are often linked in series to give us greater power. Um, so typical sul sulfuric acid. So as I mentioned earlier, I couldn't actually uh, find a picture of hydrogen gas because it's actually odorless um, and you can't see it. So, um, but this is a byproduct of, of the battery's charging process. It's lighter than air, it's flammable in nature, uh, and it's an explosive mixture at four to 74% of volume by air. You cannot taste and you cannot see the gas vapors. You can, however, smell the acid in the battery when the battery is heating up. So of course, if you've got any sort of naked flames or sparks or, or, or other flammable works nearby, this could potentially ignite this gas, which you can't see, smell or taste, um, and um, you know, leading to an explosion. Remember the sulfuric acid is corrosive material. It's gonna burn your skin. It's gonna absolutely destroy your eyes. So we never open the, cap, the battery caps with your face directly over the, over the battery for, for obvious reasons, okay? Um, so, okay, um, so various things, as I mentioned there, um, you know, it's going to get into various things, you know, when, if, if, if we did have, and there have been attributed to in, in the industry, um, battery explosions, which is, which have actually caused fires on machines. 
Um, but equally, you know, should a battery explode, and we'll see a short video shortly, um, there's various sort of aspects there. Clearly, um, your machine is connected to the uh, the wall or some method of charging. So there is a method, uh, there is, uh, and equally, when the battery is connected to the the, um, the actual machine, there is a risk of electric shock. So any expo exposed terminals, even on disconnected batteries, present a potential electric sh uh, shock hazard. Um, some battery systems are capable of discharging extremely high rates of current. So, so you've got to be really careful about accidental shorting of terminals or cables, um, and they can you know, cause severe electrical arcing, um, causing burns and electric shock to, to nearby um, personnel. So, um, I did a little bit of trawling on the internet. Very difficult to find anything about a what we call a mute battery, essentially having a having a, a, an incident. But what I did find is a you know a um, a car battery in a workshop um, and an example of what happens when something like this happens. Okay, um, so as you can see, something like that. Um, the amount of energy that's stored it that shows you a good picture of inside the plates. You can perhaps see where the water is going to be there. All the vent caps are off the top of it and any cables. And clearly that's been put to one side, you know, perhaps probably for a demonstration and, and, and you know, and a reminder timely perhaps to other people that, you know, if we mess around with these things. It's going to uh, it's, it's potentially going to bite us. So um, I'll show this video now. So this is a in truth, this is an advert for a, a blast housing for batteries, and he's essentially showing here, uh, it's an Australian film, showing what happens in an open workshop when, for example, the car battery is on charge. Um, forgive the lack of safety, PPE. Um, forgive the lack of uh, attention to some of these things, but, you know, I, I clearly can't control this. So we'll show this. I'll show it for about a minute, um, and then I'll cut it because it then goes on to about his advertising for a, for a blast, uh, blast bay, um, of which I'll cover what we have in Mukes a little bit later on. Danger, as you can see by looking at this battery. Hydrogen, very, very dangerous. Acid all over the test dummy, acid on the walls, acid on the bench. You don't need this in your workshop. You need to charge your batteries outside one of our storage solutions to ensure the safety of your workers. As you can see, complete meltdown. safe storage solution for batteries and battery charging this storage unit is the answer okay so i'll cut that guy off there all right hopefully a reasonable demonstration of what i was trying to achieve by showing you this picture here um now that in itself is a catastrophic failure of a battery if we look back to the film there briefly, and hopefully you could all see that and hear the hear the guy, um, and in slow motion you can see the battery, you know, basically explode. Um, you know, it's basically covered. Yes, he's covered in acid. He's covered in, you know, he's going to have parts of that metal, parts of that plastic, hard plastic, you know, um, you know, exploding and, and projectiles out to him. So very, 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 uh, very interesting that that's there. And I'm sure, you know, I haven't seen that clip of the 12 volt battery. Uh, explored um, when this is loaded onto our AFI website a little bit later on for a webinar for everybody to, to watch essentially some may like I said earlier think that the, the safest place is, is for an operator to, to be nowhere near that don't go near them don't go near battery covers don't open battery tops um, as I'll explain a little bit later on it's false economy you know if we train our people we supervise them um, and we ensure that they are checked and maintained the batteries can last you know a very long time remember that 12 volt battery you've seen that was one battery now if we had if you imagine from that picture that i showed you earlier the banker batteries four of them potentially giving out 24 volts um but the amps is huge um and the amount of potential energy and clearly sort of electrolyte so sulfuric acid and and deionized or, or distilled water in it it could be uh, it could be clearly catastrophic to, to to people okay so again again 
showed you one picture that you know there's another example of you know complete and utter failure of a battery um you know and, and something like that is, is all too often and too easy to happen now our uh, Australian colleague there showed a little bit there about um, a blast housing. OK, so essentially when a battery is in situ on a machine, it is in a blast housing um, and you can see them there, you know, in this sense here, that's a bank of four in there. Um, there's an example on. So on the top left, there's a, a JLG uh, boom, an M450 AJ. And on the bottom there, we've got, um, a, you know, a Genie uh, scissor lift there, something like a, a 1932 um, this particular one swings out um, whereas the top one on the left there you know will undo, undo the rubber bungs and, and, and lift that canopy um, that metal canopy off you'll see there once I've, I've exposed that canopy then that's where we've got our picture and you can see the little bungs on the right hand side there just in front of the wheel okay um, you can see there perhaps there's probably not a huge amount of distance between the top of the uh, battery uh, and where that canopy is going to, uh, uh, you know, position itself. So, generally part of the counterweight, um, it may be, like we said, either a primary source of the power. Um, and if you remove the covers, you might find the deep cell batteries. Um, the blast housing, um, so clearly is going to, essentially, if anything goes wrong, if anything goes wrong with that battery, the intention is, on the top left and the bottom, bottom middle there, is the intention there is for the uh, machine to contain the force and the explosion of the battery if it's however opened up then you know clearly the, the, the force is going to differ in, in in what it can do and blast housings do differ in their construction some some like the one at the top middle will allow you know should the cover be off for the energy to explode outwards and upwards um so um the one thing i wanted to show was the decal as well it's there for a reason i've seen people wrongly sit or stand on the on that canopy um, now it only takes the top of that metal cover to touch the top of an open or an exposed terminal uh, and unfortunately they're going to know about it um, and, and sometimes you know the first thing I do when I take off um, you know the top of a canopy I'll make sure all them terminals you know I've got the necessary you know protection on top of them uh, often in the um, in the in, in, in a in some sort of uh, rubber rubber cover if that means and you can see them like a rubber housing that goes over that terminal because if I stand or sit on that on that canopy and the terminals exposed then uh, yeah I might have a, a hot backside so um, in terms of personal safety um, risk assessment is always going to be necessary to determine the level of personal protective equipment uh, required. But remember, PPE, as you all know, is, is going to be um, deemed as the last resort. However, if you check in uh, batteries, I would recommend that this is the minimum uh, PPE required. So nitrile gloves, uh, eye protection to EN166B, um, that, that can be in the, in, the, in the guise of a face shield or, or uh, you know, eye protection. Personally, I, and that's me on the on the picture there. I prefer the face shield because I've seen uh, batteries explode with 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 goggles on, um, and they've still been damaged to the person's uh, you know jaw and uh, and nose, etc. And some type of apron or you know protection against um, the uh, the the acid. Um, but irrespective of that, you know you're going to have to check your own company's risk assessments and and work instructions, you know, on on this task. Um, clearly having you know a requirement to first aid appropriate you'll probably find that the sterile solutions in that potential first aid are inadequate because if you've been given a good soaking of um, electrolyte you're going to need copious amounts of water um you know to try and wash away um you know away the acid um as i said there's a school of thought let's not put the operator in that in that way and i've got to re-emphasize it it's false economy uh, may lead to other uh, issues from not checking the batteries in the long run such as fire and potential explosions okay some of the issues that we've had then okay chargers okay now chargers generally speaking they're inbuilt uh, into the machine um, usually 110 volts in the uk but some machines do have a switching mechanism to move them on to, to 240 volts um, the charger is going to have some sort of input cable uh, and plug um, for an ac for a dc it's going to have output uh, battery cables and a connector there's going to be a series of labels now they're going to be a mix between the actual machine and also in the um, in, in the operator's manual there's going to be an amateur that gives us some sort of or ammeter that gives you some sort of indication of charge potentially a various amount of switches um, often uh, leds so they'll give you an indication of your charge you know when the machine switches on um, so again 
typically built into the inside of the machine um, and can be actually housed in a number of places so at the back on the side um, you will always need to ensure that you've got the correct power supply for the MUP and the number of MUPs that you're potentially going to be charging throughout the, the project. And it's imperative that you follow, and I've got to say this, the manufacturer's instructions, as these will indicate the external power that is required to fully charge this machine. Um, some of the issues which do happen that we've found is that operators wrongly believe they can charge and use the machines at the same time. Now, most MUPs have an inbuilt charge interrupt circuit um, built into the machine. So the minute I start to try and use the machine whilst it's on charge it's going to it's going to switch off the charging element okay uh, and, and disrupt and, and, and interrupt the machine's power circuit so perhaps now you can imagine now the operator thinks that they are uh, charging and using the machine much like you would do with your phone if it was plugged in at your work or into your laptop so again normally this is not possible okay uh, any operator who's had a long say perhaps busy weekend um, you know perhaps thoughts elsewhere you know mind not on the job may not even charge the machine itself okay and if we now look at the two sockets here you can see these two sockets there um, they are identical virtually okay um, one for one is for charging and one is for providing power in the platform um, so you plug the machine in and wait so you plug the machine in and you wait for the charging lights um, to start their sequence uh, of charging it may equalize um, equally no lights no charge what's wrong I've plugged it into the wrong one so you'll see some in, in indication there so on the top picture there what I'm trying to get at there is if I plug my charging lead into the one on the right okay I'm going to provide power to my platform if I plug it into the one to the left I'm going to provide uh, power to the machine to then start charging the machine the amount of times I've gone or even when I've been conducting training courses you know and you know you're getting people that are coming back on on re refresher training and they think that they're uh, you know they know how to put a machine on charge and they're actually putting the machine on you know in, into power to platform mode so again you know giving an idea of that is something that's one of the tips yeah great your machine's dead because you guys or your girls haven't charged the machine uh, and Amity incidentally uh, the more flat the machine is the higher the amps the machine will draw from the power so this of course will reduce as the machine is then charged so again depending on what type of power you're, you're actually uh, bringing from or drawing from you know, can have a big big indicator okay so pre-use checks I must stress this we never carry out pre-use checks on a machine which is still on charge okay so disconnect to, disconnect the charge from the power source so mains wall socket transformer whatever it is and then what we need to remember then is to disconnect the batteries and I'll show you that very shortly um, this is sometimes disconnecting batteries is carried out in in different ways um, a typical one that's quite common in our industry it's what's called the Anderson plug um, which we disconnect but other methods may be present such as battery isolator switches um, mushroom safety safety stops so you can see the uh, the isolator there you can perhaps see a, 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 what we call a, a red uh, safety stop there that'll, ch that'll switch the machine off. Uh, that's an example of an Anderson plug there, okay, uh, on a on a machine, and that's the potential of that machine being completely isolated now from power and the batteries from the machine. Okay, the amount of people I see again, they're starting working on a machine or starting checking on the machine, and the, the thing's still connected to it to its to to the actual machine. You know, just disconnect it all time. Um, Again, pre-use checks, be kind of mindful that the machine may have just finished charging. Okay, so therefore the gas that is produced when the machine is on charge is hydrogen gas. It's most likely still got to dissipate adequately. You know, if you can imagine now you've got 10 machines in a, in a relatively small fit out area that you're working on, you can just imagine now the potential hydrogen gas there first thing in the morning. Okay, um, strictly no source of ignition, grinding, welding, you know any hot works or, or you know clearly no smoking but you know hot works etc um we're going to think about the environment where we are is it a busy location is there passing machines you know so if we're busy often we're when we're checking batteries we're below you know we're kind of bent down so you know people maybe um you know can't see us um battery locations i've shown you two there i mean there's many different variations as such some of the canopies are huge on some of the some of the big machines but you know think of like battery locations um, and I'm thinking pen you know scissor platforms what about mass booms that are double stacked so like this picture here there so you can see there what we call a double stack battery I've had to open the canopy of the machine um, I think we could all probably agree I've got 
pretty good access to the ones on the top, you know, and I'd be able to look at that re reasonably easily. Um, but your honor, I couldn't get to the ones on the bottom. Well, you can, and, and, and there are information contained within the manufacturer's operating manual that tells you how to, to, to unlock and pull out the top battery. So the top battery will hinge through 90 degrees, which then gives me access to the, to the battery underneath. Um, some of these machines and particularly these as well, because they are difficult to get to and, and, and what some of the, the manufacturers have done, have introduced um, uh, watering uh, systems. Um, so you can, you know, the, the machine will self water and, uh, or you can water it um, to, to top up the batteries, etc. cetera. Um, so again, great picture there, but you know, battery casing, leads, caps, securing mechanisms, etc. So quite simple, quite straightforward. And you can see that here we've got kind of like a different method of a, a you know of a blast housing certainly if this you know if something went wrong here you know it's going to go straight upwards isn't it yeah okay um so hopefully that makes sense okay um as i mentioned earlier one of the key points that stands out in our business is that the reported electrical breakdowns were attributed to over 40 percent of our reported breakdowns in in a, in a, in a certain period so when we looked at this again, yeah, operator error, you know, lack of pre-use checks or, or, or maintenance, post hire or post day checks on the, on the on the batteries, you know, we have this you know unfortunate way of just thinking you know everything's disposable in this life. So what we need to remember is that we still need to maintain these um, because it's going to potentially cost you uh, you know in the um, in the pocket as a, as a business. Um, it's fair to state they're quite expensive, not, in, not only in the direct cost of the replacement when they have failed, but also, like I said earlier, to the downtown of the machine um, and the people requiring its use. Uh, and they will no doubt be stood around or, or, or having to find other, thing, other things to do. So some of the damage invoices highlight how much sometimes the higher is charged, let's say, for a bank of batteries. Uh, and these costs can actually run into the thousands of pounds in, in some extreme cases, depending on the size of the batteries. And again, like I said, it's a process where you think about it. You finish your shift, you found your charge, you know, you found your parking area, you found the charging lead, you plug it in, and you forget about it. Well, how wrong that is, really. Checks should be carried out on the machine post shift, which includes the batteries, because when this machine has been on charge and when it has been working, you know that that um, deionized water that's in there is is going to evaporate. So essentially, we can expose the tops of our um, uh, bat uh, battery. Uh, plates which in essentially can give give us damage to the batteries um, what we've also got to remember of course is um, that there is an ever increasing re uh, issue of theft of batteries um, we've had incidents before where um, these have identified at pre-use check uh, stage so great the operators are checking the machine over open up the battery camp and canopy to find there's no batteries there um, uh, you know and why I, pff, we, we're, we're not privy to what happens on site and such like that but you know again once you finish with the machine remember you know you're still res responsible under cpa terms and conditions that you're responsible for the machine for, for a period of time after the actual machines um you know finish with and again i've done a previous webinar on the, on this exact matter um we've gone to our own depots unfortunately before where we've been the um you know the uh, had the result of um, theft of batteries from our own depo depots as well. Um, so think about it when you've left the machines. I'm never going to say that, you know, it could be another contractor on site who's ruined his own batteries, but, you know, who knows. Um, but just one, one, one just to be a little bit mindful of. So in terms of maintenance, um, a fact is that a properly watered battery will last longer and performs better throughout its lifetime. Um, what we add to the... Um, the battery is distilled or demineralized water and this is going to help the battery perform better and for longer now with everything there is a warning overfilling a battery can result in the loss of sulfuric acid so what i don't want all you people to now start doing is overfilling them with water um, a serious risk um, is charging with low electrolyte levels um, so we haven't got enough water in the battery we start to charge them charge the machine um, and this can result in permanent damage to the lead plates. So if you think about something exposed uh, in the air, it's been heated up, all right, um, 
of over time, um, and it won't happen overnight, but over time, or it could happen overnight. I, don't, I haven't heard that, but the battery can warp. Uh, the battery plate, should I say, can warp. And it, you know, you need one plate to touch another plate. Um, there are a series of positive and, and negative, bang, you know, we've got a problem there. So both of these, though, however, can result in loss of capacity and the life expectancy and, and clearly the downtime uh, of the machine. If I take a battery that I'm looking at now, I don't just wade straight in there. I'm going to look at the battery, you know, obviously done my PPE as appropriate to risk assessment, but I'm going to look for anything, things like cracks, any chips, any diff, you know, deformation anywhere. Perhaps even bulging of the battery would give you a bit of an indication. Um, I also need to be kind of mindful of what I'm carrying around my person. Things like watches, things like rings, you know, jewellery, chains. You know, again, I only need to touch a very short distance from one of them terminals, which may be uh, potentially exposed to that metal battery clamp or that side you know and i potentially could uh, you know cause cause myself to weld to the battery for starters um but equally you know could cause the explosion so things like metal rulers screwdrivers that that sort of thing um of course improper fluid levels or, or damaged cables again and connections can result in component damage uh, and, ha and potentially hazardous um conditions so again um so nice and steady, take your time, think about it. I mentioned earlier that there are some machines that have uh, watering systems, but equally as well, cleanliness of battery is important. The battery's got to be able to breathe and the white vent caps, and I'll show you a picture of a vent cap shortly, has got to be able to, to breathe. If it gets clogged up, it can't breathe, you know, again, and that can cause other issues as well. So quite simple, quite straightforward. Watering systems are becoming more common on some machines now. Um, again, nice, nice and easy, quite, quite easy to to, to work with. Um, so just on water levels. Um, again, we don't try not to look over the top of a battery unless I'm completely covered in my PPE and and, and things like that, and I'm, I'm mindful about various things. But what we should be looking at is when you open. You know, and again, I'm showing you what you actually look at here. There's the vent cap removed, as you can see, uh, and underneath there, um, you can see you've removed the vent cap. You look down the top of the battery, you will see some various means of identifying the minimum level of the correct level of the battery. Um, and looking further down into that battery, um, you'll be able to see the battery plates, you know, lined up uh, whichever way they they are positioned. And I do know from experience that often it's difficult to see the correct level. Number one, we're trying not to look directly over the battery. Uh, and number two, though, it may be, you know, it may be dark. The lighting may not be not be great. So especially when there are potentially 24 or, or 48 cells or however many cells it is, it could be dark or indeed, you know, um, potentially even very bright sometimes. And, and you can see that quite easily. But it could distort your view or potential view of the current level of, of, of the electrolyte. So we may need some direct light to help and assist the situation. So for heaven's sake, you know, only use something that's intrinsically safe, uh, like a torch to look into the battery and never use a naked flame or, or, you know, something like that. You may laugh, but it has happened before and, and the battery's gone, you know, unfortunately bang in front of, uh, in, in somebody's face. Um, so if the plates are not covered by at least approximately 13 millimeters, half an inch of, of, of the solution, you need to add distilled or deionized water. Um, big warning um we've got a tub of sulfuric acid over there i'll tell you what i'm going to do that battery's been working really really naff i'm going to add some to it we never ever ever add sulfuric acid to water um you do that and it's going to blow back in your face straight away and you know again this this could be fatal so again re-emphasize you never add sulfuric acid to water you can add distilled or deionized water to the battery OK, um, always avoid spilling or contacting uh, contacting battery acid on your skin or clothing. Those of you who've ever had it before will know that well, it just looks like my clothing's damp. Uh, and I have had it before, I will add. Um, it's only when you go to wash it, OK, then you find that it starts to fall apart. If you do get, um, you know, acid or, or, or electrolyte on your skin, then you need to neutralize any battery acid spills with, and the best thing is baking soda and plenty of water. So generally speaking, we tend not to have baking soda at work. Um, so you're gonna, you may have another solution that's specifically provided for batteries, um, but you are gonna get, you know, copious amounts of water on there and flush and keep it flushed, okay? Um, so clearly that, that procedure, what I'm showing you there, doesn't have to be performed on machines with have sealed or, or maintenance free batteries. So you can see the, the risk is, is less there, but in truth, you know, there's a hell of a lot of machines out there with, with lead acid batteries. 
Okay, charging then. So we should always allow a full charge cycle uh, to take place. Um, now, ideally, um, it should be overnight, depending on the discharge state of the batteries. Now, charging cycles uh, do um, depend. Uh, charging cycles depend on the batteries uh, and can take anywhere from six to twelve hours to complete. I've seen them take longer on some larger machines. Um, so there's a fallacy for starters sometimes you think you can charge me mobile phone within sort of 15 minutes yeah you know 20 minutes get you know 85 percent charge this is not going to happen with the one of these type of machines so try and avoid partial charging and what i mean by that is during lunch or, or tea breaks and we often see that on site you know the guys and girls will go away for the breaks they'll shove the machine on charge you know and you you're potentially causing damage to the machine there you should always ensure you've got the correct input um, and voltage and amperage for, for the actual information contained in the manufacturer's manual for the machine. Um, perhaps for some trap machines or you know uh, spider type machines, it may be worth you contacting your hire or your rental company for the correct charge and the lead requirements, uh, as these can have a det detrimental effect on the level of power received at the actual charger. And we've had cases before where people have put in like a 20 meter, 30 meter charging lead. Um, from a source of power to a machine only to find that you know the, the charge that the machine has received like anything is going to be going to be less the longer the actual lead is um, you may only you may find perhaps that the only source of, of power on site um, not from a main side things is potentially you know a site generator um, now mute mute batteries require a stable voltage um, so for example a typical battery powered scissor lift uh, will require an input of around 100 volts at 3 kVA, whereas that small site generator may not be able to, you know, to deliver that type of power. So again, it's worth checking that. And you know, in truth, you're probably not going to see that type of site generator, but you know, you may have, you know, a new site where that's the only source of power. And I've seen this where the only source of power we've got on site is actually, actually that. Um, so be, be mindful of that. The other thing is, are you certain that the site power is constant and maintained throughout the night? Often main generators are turned off and site lighting cabins, are, you know, site lighting and cabins are powered by smaller generators, which are not capable of, of the type of power that's required for charging, uh, you know, an actual a mupe there. OK, um, as I mentioned, lead, it's got to be the correct type for the uh, for the amperage um, that you're requiring and check labels, check connectors. You know, they often get run over because people unplug them and just launch them down the ground. Then that has a detrimental effect on being able to charge the machine later on right? because I can't actually get it into the charger. Um, the two main types of leads, we're going to have a 16 and 32 amp depending on the, on the required power. As I mentioned earlier about the length of leads. Um, the longer the lead, the bigger the voltage drop. Quite simple. Um, you should never daisy chain uh, or what we call double up leads to, as all this does is lower the voltage at the receiving end. Um, and we never leave a lead coiled up like that, because um, what that can do is create heat resistance um, and voltage drop. So you could actually potentially, you know, if it's bad enough, cause a cause a fire. Um, but more importantly, you know, just like when you're mowing the lawn, you should extend your, your um, extension lead. How many of us do? Um, but yeah, so that, you, you know, the, the heat is dissipated. Um, always route cables, uh, clearly with consideration to walkways, environment. I've seen them led before in water, um, you know, and again, you know, this, you know, you've got to think, you know, I think today, um, we've had beautiful sunshine last week i think today the heavens are going to open again yeah but again we're going to have issues there with water later on and, and, and low lying areas you know clearly think about it you know what about snow uh, that sort of thing i've seen machines you know outside charging you know it's snowing it's going to melt isn't it at some point okay so be so be a little bit mindful of, of this so charging quite simple quite straightforward but just just try to think about you know what 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 you've got actually on your site um, and of course, you know, when you do get your charger, what you'll see is when once I've plugged it in, OK, and you can see this particular sizzle lift is 24 volts. Once I've plugged it in, you can see there on the right hand side, it's saying, look in the manual. It's giving you input output. It's giving you the model. It's giving you them sort of aspects of the charger. Once I've plugged my charging lead in for my my power. All right. These batteries are going to do some sort of, you know, check of the cells and etc. All right. Because, you know, if you've got eight 
four, six, whatever batteries, they're all going to, they're not all going to work constantly the same. You'll get some that are more discharged than others. It will do an equalizing charge essentially to bring them all up to the same level. And then it'll charge, charge them all in, in, in one go typically. Um, but again, I'm no, I'm no battery expert as such. I'm sure there's more technologies out there that, you know, will bring them all up to, to one level there. Okay. Battery use. Um, so where again this is some of the issues that we potentially find um you know i've got a 500 meter work warehouse and i'm going to drive it 500 meters uh, on battery power and then they wonder when they get to the other end of it why why it doesn't actually work um so impossible plan the work to reduce the distance that you're traveling you know they use a lot of power when they're traveling you know a two-ton scissor lift driving along um try and reduce where we can lifting and lowering cycles because this will help um you know in terms of actually using the machine um you know uh, accordingly one uh one which we, makes often you know sales and that's mute sales salesmen and saleswomen smile is why do you just hire a few more machines you know so again don't flog the machine you know to 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 the point of which it can't do anymore you know just 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 hire another two or three i'm, I'm doing that in jest there okay obviously you're going to hire the machines that you, you need to hire um but um yeah so um but you know look at onboard charges okay the other thing is um if you think about it in terms of it we may you have to consider how far we are away from a charging point are there sufficient charging ports available now some machines may have like here what we call a sort of a, an analog type system so that machine's currently turned off um, that machine is on charge okay so there you can see there it's on charge when i take that machine off charge it's going to default to the the picture on the left hand side and you can see there i'm going to i've got empty and full in the green motion of there once i've started to um use that power clearly that needle is going to fall down towards e now if i'm 300 feet or wherever it is from from the actual charging point guess what i maybe can't get over to the charging point before she starts going into the red all right so again just things that we need to to to, to think about now some machines may actually have a um, you know a flashing light in the platform you don't actually get you know an indicator of your current charge uh, in the manual for example it may give you an indication of how many flashes you get um, to, to, to give you an indication that you need to start making your way to a you know a, a, a charging area i put a picture in here of the ground control uh, station on a hulot star 10 so you can see there for example it's got i think it's hopefully you can see that two green lights um, so essentially that's giving you a charge indicator which is on the base of the machine which is where you start you know when you're doing your pre-use checks and whatnot it'll give you an indication of charge but in the platform i've literally just got a red light um, and that red light is a number of factors, things like overload, things like tilt, things like batteries potentially. Okay. So, um, however, some some uh, manufacturers will give you potentially a um, you know a series of LEDs. And on this potential genie one here, all right, you can see there that you know it's obviously off the machine, um, but that little indicator there will be a series of uh, green LED lights as you can see indicated on the right hand side and that will give you again an, an indication of the power notified of the power um, and, and give you that that idea of where you need to be um, and, and when you need to sort of start sort of thinking I need to get this on charge so you know consideration and control of unauthorized use is important um, and I, you know nearly on every webinar I talk about making sure that we control our mutes properly but you've got to consider night shift use too as well yeah so people are using your equipment that you've paid for and hired uh, on a night time um, and there are systems and methods out there we have our own smart zone system which prevents anybody else from using the machine um, and only allows your operators to use it. Um, but, you know, the, the theft of power or the theft of, of your machine, you know, potentially on a night time. And I say that theft with inverted commas um, is all too, too, uh, too prevalent these days. And don't forget as well, of course, they may do damage to the machine. But there are ways and means in which we can do it. Yes, I can put a padlock on, the, on, on some isolators. Yes, I can put, you know, the e-stops in. But, you know, if we ask many contractors out there, they've all got, uh, you know, uh, the, the keys to start these machines up. Okay, um, one that I needed to to, an, to answer, uh, sorry, to, to add, should I say, was a little bit about cold store use. I didn't have a very, very good picture of a machine in a cold store. I've got one, you know, in there that you can see some sort of like, you know, chill, chillers. But, um, you know, in terms of this, um, you know, the reason why I'm putting this on the, 
temperature it can play a critical role in the performance of a battery um, you all know yourselves you know high you know higher higher temperatures battery capacity generally increases though it's usually at the expense and cost of the battery life as the temperature increases the rate of that reaction increases so general rule of thumb is that every 10 degrees fahrenheit increase in temperature results in a two or three fold increase in the reaction rate therefore back you know what i'm saying there therefore batteries in a hot environment accelerate the self discharge characteristics so they're going to you know it's going to work faster going to work and basically find that you're going to discharge it quickly Conversely, in lower temperatures, the battery capacity generally is, uh, decreases. So think about your own mobile phone. You're outside, you, you've gone to a football match, it's freezing. You find your battery goes like like the clappers. And you, and you work nine, nine times out of ten trying to keep the battery warm. How many of you have taken the um, the batteries out of a, a remote control and rubbed them back and forth to, to get some heat into them? You're probably smiling now thinking, yeah, I've done that. Um, so as the temperature decreases, the rate of reaction decreases. And this, obviously, uh, uh, you know, so the the, the um, the, the, the negative effect of slowing the, the self-discharge characteristic. It's there positive that batteries that are subjected to freezing temperatures, you know, are stored properly and fully charged, at high state of charge. So when in cold temperatures, they're going to discharge quicker, just like your phone or any battery powered potential like these order pickers or fork trucks or, or pallet trucks, etc. Um, remember, on average, an eight hour charge on a, on a machine in a cold store is probably going to last 20 to 30 minutes tops um i've seen them last 15 minutes before in a cold stuff store and you basically you go in do 15 minutes work and you've got to you've got to be headed on out uh, as you as you uh, uh, you know before that thing does actually shut down on you um, and this is because these are extreme cold places clearly and again this is something i mean that them them um sort of forklift type um, order picker type things the pallet trucks you can see there they'll have two or three batteries that they use um, potentially um, and they'll go in and out um, they'll be well insulated okay they'll be specifically for cold stores once they get to a charge point they'll drive back to where it is they'll take that battery out they'll put the new battery in and away they go again it doesn't happen with with mupes it does not happen okay so consider now the picture on the right hand side we don't get out there in time I just need to get this last fitting in. I just need to get that thing in, whatever. If I've now come out there, I've now got to put it on another charge. It's going to cost me time and the battery dies. Not only is the risk assessment got to be considering to get getting somebody down because a rescue plan would then have to consider the effects of somebody stuck up in the air in a blast chiller or a freezer or a cold cold store, etc. Um, you may find, and this has happened um, with a previous company that I worked for, um, where a company took a, scissor type machine into a, into a cold store and it um, got stuck up in the air because the battery died um, everything froze and I mean everything the only way they got the machine out the door is they cut it up because it couldn't actually get down uh, they couldn't actually lower it anymore it all frozen solid a very costly mistake okay so let's just move on to training um, and try and sort of dispel some of the rumors here um, clearly um, from a battery point of view um, these these have been a bone of contention since the day I first stepped foot into the IPAF training committee, and I've been you know from the IPAF training committee side of things, whether I've been a committee member or a training committee chairman, it's been one of the longest um, you know arguments discussions. It generally rears its head every now and again, probably every couple of months. You know the the argument for and against the checking of batteries. Um, in truth, it's never gone away because you still got to check your batteries whether you like it or not. And that is the bottom line. Trainees um, who attend any IPAF operators course will, during a theory um, session, discuss batteries with their, you know, you know, instructor. Um, they will discuss the, the concept of it, how they work, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If the course, however, is e-learning, um, then this will be through the the audio um, that's on the e-learning uh, e-learning course. Once we've done this, you know, and there'll be a potentially a, th a theory question on the um, on the batteries uh, and how you know uh, you know doesn't go into too much depth but they, they will get a theory question we then go on to the practical the instructor having done a full pre-use check of the machine will in inevitably at some point get to the batteries um, if it's on a battery powered machine that is the instructor will wear full wear full ppe appropriate to any site risk assessments um, the instructor on the practical session um, we'll provide a demonstration, demonstration uh, commentary, 
uh, on safely checking the batteries and they will give thorough commentary throughout that actual process. Instructor will then uh, potentially pick a, you know, a battery or two and show the procedure of, of checking the batteries uh, and making sure anything needs to top up, the batteries will be topped. Okay. The instructor will then, you know, out of the delegates, choose a delegate at random um, to carry out the checks on another battery. And then if you're like me, I'll get another one to, 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 to check. So, so potentially not everybody does check a battery, all right? Because again, the, the course, we've still got to get the guys and girls actually on the machines and such, all right? But there's a fundamental, everybody's watching from a safe distance and, and, and doing that, doing this properly. Clearly, uh, on the location of batteries, they are going to be machine dependent. So again, depending on what type of machine they're, they're working on, depends on, on where they're actually going to get, um, you know, the batteries, um, you know, demonstrated to them. I've had it before where, you know, oh, I didn't know the batteries were there because that was different to the machine I was on previously. The information is contained in the manual. They will go through safe disconnecting of batteries from the power source and from the actual charger and from the actual um, method of dis, uh, isolating the machine. They will wear the personal safety equipment. So they already know they should be wearing nitrile gloves, eye protection or face shield, EM1, uh, E166B, um, and they will use that PPE um, and wear it during their checks. And they will do a physical check of the battery. They will be asked questions. They will be asked questions on, on, on you know, what they should be looking for. So there's no, you know, if God forbid, somebody says to you, oh, you know, I wasn't certain about the batteries when they came back from a training course. Um, I'm unfortunately they're um, they're telling you a porky. Okay, so um, environmentally, nearly towards the end of the, the webinar now. A little bit about recycling. Yes, you know, at the end of the battery's life, we do have to recycle the batteries. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some people, other people, uh, sometimes do this for free for us, um, which uh, unfortunately causes no end of dramas when we come to our machines and find there's no batteries in them. Um, but like everything, we, you know, we have corporate social responsibility. We have a policy in place to recycle as many batteries as we possibly can with our battery manufacturers. I won't go into the details of that, but we are seeing you know, an increase in our battery recycling, which is great. You've got to consider the environmental aspects of your batteries. You know, think about spill kits, potentially other impacts and aspects from your batteries too. Um, if you've ever seen a machine tip over, there's all, you know, uh, or overturn, shall I say, there's all manner of, of fluids that do actually come out of, of this. So potentially it could be electrolyte um, that's now heading towards, you know, drains or, or, or water sources. So consider these sorts of things um, and consider the, the aspects of these too. Okay, right. Um, I'm getting towards the end of it, as you can see. Um, I can see there I've got, you've been very kind to me today because other than Sarah asking a question earlier about being muted, there's no questions there at the moment. But, you know, I want to ask that, you know, this is part of our um, um, acting safely and responsible um, um, of our business. And it's an integral element of AFI Group of Companies philosophy. So we are committed to improving health and safety standards in the industry through sharing and best practice and learning, you know, the learning of some of the aspects of what we're doing. Okay. We learn, we've, we've kind of been, you know, probably wearing my heart on my sleeve here, but we're telling you the things that we've actually come across and, and, and dramas that we, we've had. Okay, so we host quarterly health and safety webinars, and these are open to everybody, and produce a quarterly health and safety bulletin for internal and external distribution. Um, uh, we are one of the leading providers of industry accredited work in height training courses, and provide our customers with safety guidance through these webinars, seminars, and safety bulletins. What I would say is, if anybody has any questions um, and perhaps don't want to answer uh, to to ask the questions live in the webinar, it basically no no, no issues at all. I do get your questions afterwards, um, so I will answer them. Um, but of course, if you know those of you listening today, thank you, um, thank you for attending. And if you have got any potential subjects that you wish perhaps um, that we may need to cover on the webinar then uh, you know by all means please let me know um and i'll you know consider consider these and uh, and get in touch with you thank you very much okay have a great day